My name is Diana Kugel and I grew up in Georgia, um, kind of in the country in Georgia. And I moved to um, the Applegate in the 60s, moved to Oregon uh, as a part of the sweep west of the hippie movement. And why is history important? We all need to know what happened before so that we can know how to proceed in the future. And I have um, lived on the same piece of land for more than 40 years, up in the mountains above the Applegate. I did commentaries on Jefferson Public Radio about living on that land um, for about 20, 25 or more years. And I lived in a little house that I built myself without electricity. Uh, so I lived for almost 40 years without electricity. And it was quite an adventure living there, and it was way up in the mountains in a remote spot. Um, I like to say I was closer to my neighbors in nature than to my human neighbors, which was true. When I first moved up there, I didn't have a car, so I was hitchhiking wherever I went. And for years, people would say, I remember you, didn't you used to hitchhike with a big green backpack? And I didn't have a car, I didn't have any electricity. Um, so obviously I didn't have all the conveniences of kitchen equipment and uh, entertainment and electric lights and those kinds of things. So I had kerosene lamps, I heated by wood. Um, first winter I was up there, there was about three feet of snow. It didn't snow like that until this past winter when I had the same amount again this year. Now I live in a house that has electricity, but it's on the same piece of land. And um, so, I, so I, I'm living in the place where I've lived for more than 40 years. And that's real significant to me because I think our roots are important. I, I, I said um, one time I, I met a Japanese girl at a party here in the Applegate, and she asked me how I came to Oregon, and I said I was a part of the hippie movement, and she said, what is hippie? <laughs> and I thought, oh, not everybody knows. Um, but yeah, it was, the, it was the back to the land movement, was the part of the hippie movement that, that I related to. Um, a lot of getting back to what we thought would be self-sufficiency. It wasn't, but we tried. Um, living in the mountains and being close to nature. Um, those things were more important to me than the political part of the hippie movement although it was all based in the same thing. Uh, there was a big emphasis on communal living, so I lived in community before I moved to the Applegate. Um, I lived in a community in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, so this, this idea of living communally and learning to love each other um, was, was important. Eating well, eating organically, um, those things were very important. Um, it was interesting that the hippie movement was uh, kind of an underground thing so that people became aware of communes all over the West Coast and um, the, uh, the commune that I was in in California was started by my partner and me and, um, and then friends of his came to join and then friends of theirs came to join and there were about 12 of us who lived there for two years. Um, but lots of people came in and out and back and forth and I just um, last weekend went to the site of another commune that I lived in south of Ashland called Hokola and um, a very remote place um, at a higher altitude so there was lots of snow and same idea that a lot of uh, people lived there who wanted to live communally with each other keep the garden uh, we didn't have much money um, but it was such a significant place to me personally because I had just come out of the mental institution and was at rock bottom in my own life. There was, um, uh, I read somewhere that schizophrenia is a shattering of the personality and I felt like my personality had been entirely shattered. So going back to this commune where these people, when I, when I went there, 
I said, I know what communal living is like and I can't do it now. I, I'm not strong enough in myself. I can't pull my weight. And they said, it's all right. You'll do it when you can. Just stay here and take care of yourself first. And it was two years of complete healing. And I don't know many places that would allow that kind of thing. And you know, at its best, the hippie movement did that. These people who said, do what you can, and when you can, you can do more. It's complete healing, it was wonderful. Sorry about moving to, was it the Colstein Valley then that you moved to? The Colstein Valley. Um, I had been living with a group of people and um, I went crazy uh, and was in Napa State Hospital for about four or five months, uh, diagnosed with schizophrenic. Was this in California? I made my way to California um, in disguise. Because I have lots of friends that ended up in hospitals under Reagan. <laughs> that was not a good yeah, time. It was not a good time. No. So did you have any children? Uh, I had one. Yeah, I won't hear you at all. Okay. So oh. you, you brought a child to, uh, to the Colstein Valley? Um, he stayed with his dad most of the time. So after I got out of the hospital, I was taken to a woman who said, another friend took me to a woman and said she needs a home. And Sasha said, I have a teepee on my land. She can live in the teepee. So that was Hokola in the Colstein Valley. And so I lived there um, with that group of people. And my son was mostly with his father until I got myself back on my feet and was sure of myself again. And, um, and but he would come and stay with me for a couple of weeks at a time or that something must have like been that. Good for him. So how many people lived on the commune? Uh, that's always an interesting question because it varied according right. to what day it was. Um, there were probably at Hokola seven or eight um, permanent members and um, I was one of those for two years, but at any time there might be a dozen or 15 people there staying for several days, or people came and they left and they came and they left. And so how did you support yourself? Did you grow your own food? We had a wonderful garden and we were vegetarians, so we could uh, feed ourselves a great deal from the garden. Um, there was a restaurant in Ashland called Mums, a famous restaurant that was run by five guys, and one of them lived at Hokola, so Hokola members would go down and help out at the restaurant every so often. And, um, and then one fall we decided we needed to make some money, and so we would go to Lake Chelan in Washington and pick apples. Uh -huh. But somebody had to stay and take care of the land. So I said I would stay. And this was a huge thing for me because it was very remote, just enormous forests and fields and hills and nobody else for miles around. And for me to stay there by myself after um, having going after having been through the uh, schizophrenic episodes, um, took a great deal of courage. Can I do this? And so it was after that that I knew I was, um, because I did do it. Right. And I took care of the land while they were making money. Um, so and, and after that, I knew that I was on my feet again and could take care of myself and my son. So the land was healing, it sounds like. I see that land as healing, definitely. The land, the people, that the people let me live there without. Um, I told them I couldn't pull my own weight, and they said, that's all right. You'll do what you can, and when you can do more, you'll do more. So, that, so it was a wonderful, wonderful place for me to um, find myself again. And I think hippie communes, at their best, fulfilled that kind of function. So how did the people, your neighbors, treat you? We had no you? neighbors. None at all? No neighbors. This was a very remote place. And when I went back last weekend, I saw how remote it is. Even though there are people on the road now, there are other houses, but it is still remote. And, and being on the place of Hokola and looking around and you see nothing but hills and then you see the freeway, way in the distance. <laughs> I remember one time at the, um, when I was living at Hokola, I woke up in the middle of the night and I heard, Om, Om, and I 
about who would be oming in the middle of the night. And then I realized I was hearing the freeway trucks going on. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that ever presence and that reminder. The, yeah, that it was remote. Part of, you know, feeling right. how remote we were is that, wow, that's, that is so far away from what we are and what we're doing. And, there was a commune down the road um, called Rainbow Star that turned into the Tibetan Buddhist, um, and and I think it was founded after Hokola, um, and it was way down the other end of the road. Um, that was all that was in this area. In the Applegate, there were four or five uh, communes. Can you tell us about those? Um, well, there was Moto Bini, which um, had, you know, the usual dozen people in it. And um, it kept going the longest of any of the commune. And, and people still live on the land, and the group of people are still friends. And so that was a very successful commune. Um, there was uh, Trillium, and I taught at Trillium School. Um, the alternative school that at Trillium Commune. And uh, that was a different kind of commune. It was kind of more strict. They had rules. They were trying to do deliberate things, whereas Moto Bini and communes like that were much more loose. You know, we just lived together and we have dinners together. And um, there was a commune close to where I'm living now called um, Laser Farm. And I used to live, before I moved to the land where I'm living now, I lived in a barn um, that we turned into a house. And I used to walk over the ridge down to Laser Farm on the other side, so from Williams into the Thompson Creek Valley. And then I'd stay there for a few days and walk back, and sometimes I'd ride the horse over there. And so there was a lot of, lot of interaction uh, among people in the communes. It was lots of fun, we, we knew each other. Eastside House was another commune, it was the most um, laid back commune. They had no, let's see, the only rules were um, no dogs in the kitchen and uh, no, I don't know, no dogs in the kitchen. I remember that one. Um, so it, it depended. The communes each had their own personality, so to speak. And I look back at those communes now and I know which ones I would, would have enjoyed being a member of and which ones I would not have wanted to be a member of. It varied. Was it generally about 12 people, generally about a dozen? I have heard a number of people, you know, you say how many people were in the commune, and they say what I just said, well, there were so many people coming and going. Yeah. Um, generally, 8 to 12, I think, is probably the number that most communes would um, stay at most of the time. That? Why, why That's a good question. I think more than a dozen. A dozen is even a lot of people to deal with. That's a lot of personalities to try to mesh. And on the other hand, when you have 12 or 13, 14 people together, you have these wonderful gatherings in the evenings and there's always music and, and you have lots of people to help with the meals and that kind of thing. Um, if it's fewer than eight, six or eight, um, there's a whole lot of work to be done and you begin to feel like the, the burden of the work is, is heavy. So I, I, th I think maybe there's a balance between 6 and 12 or something like that. So did all of those communes in the Applegate work the land? They all worked the land. I think that was a, um, a commonality in communes that um, it was a back to the land movement. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to a greater or lesser extent, I know Molto Bini um, grew their own hay and they grew their wine for their, um, uh, the grapes for their wine. and. They were much closer to self-sufficiency than most of the communes that I, certainly more than the ones I lived at. One of my favorite um, memories from the commune in California where I lived for two years um, was that uh, I was baking bread and another uh, woman in the commune named Janet uh, was also baking bread and so we baked a lot of bread, but we were not growing our vegetables very well. It was very dry and, and we weren't good farmers. Um, so one day we took our breads in baskets and put cloths over them and we're in our hippie gear with our beads and our long skirts and, and we went down to the valley and started knocking on the doors of the farmhouses and saying, um, we bake bread but you'd like to trade bread for vegetables. And they just loved it. They just thought that was the best thing. So we did that 
I, I guess until the commune fell apart, we were trading bread for vegetables. Uh -huh. You know, your, your acid insight. And right. so man came when I did, uh, I think it was my first acid trip with, with my boyfriend, my partner. And, um, and he went off tripping somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I'm so low. <laughs> I'm just, you know, just real, and everything is exaggerated on acid. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I thought, boy, you can make yourself miserable if you want to. <laughs> and just immediately I said, okay, I don't want to be miserable. And so, but that was a good insight. You know, that's, that's wisdom. Yeah. That's, that's something you can take away after the drug trip and say, right. you know, you can make yourself miserable if you want to, but you don't have to be miserable. Right. <laughs> So there are acid insights. If you remember them. If you remember them. What happens on acid is that things become brighter and, and everything, whether it's the colors or the movement or, um, you know, you look at the clouds and everything has got life to it. And, and I think there's something about that, that that really does enhance our understanding of what we see and the ones that we look at the clouds now and know, well, it looks pretty static, but I know now how much movement there is up there. And wow, these colors, now I'm more aware of colors when I look otherwise. But I will add that my personal experience is that acid is a very dangerous drug and um, for uh, borderline um, psychic cases, uh, it's very da marijuana is very dangerous. I would never ever do any drugs again because, um, because of my experience. And, but not everybody is like that. Many people can handle it. But if when, when, I hear, um, when I hear people talking about how good drugs are, I can say, yes, they are, but you have to be very careful who you give it to and who's taking it because it can also be very dangerous things. And, and the music in the evenings and um, sharing the meals together, that was always um, always important to that communal feeling. And I, I, think those, I think those communes that lasted for a few years and fell apart, I think they were really good for us as a society and, and, and what we learned collectively by going through that period. I think they were important, even if they didn't last. I think one of the principles of the communes was an, a kind of integrated living, mm -hmm. so that your work and your spirituality right. and your and, and, and your recreation it was all a part of the same thing, and it wasn't. We're, we were trying to get rid of that kind of separation. Right. So, um, yeah, there was a great deal of talk about spirituality, and there were some people who were very um, felt very strongly that the drugs were a means to um, a higher spiritual life. Um, so, yeah. Nudity. Um, why? Well, because we were free. You know, we we felt like clothes were an encumberment, and especially if it's hot. So um, I remember at the the commune in California where I lived. Um, I was burning brush with another woman. It was a really hot day, and we were burn, burning brush down in the orchard. And so we took off our shirts, and we went, I think just our shirts. And we were burning brush, and that was the day that the police came to raid the commune because it was rumored that we were uh, um, had out of um, uh, black, um, and that we had guns and black people, and you know, well, we did. One member was black, and so, and we had no guns. Uh, but anyway, the police came and they raided us, and so everybody else was up in the main building, but they came down to the orchard and, to get the two of us who were down there without our shirts. I think that was the time that they said, do you, do you have any identification? And I said, well, not on me. <laughs> Nothing came with that raid, by the way. They saw that we were peaceful, loving hippies. You know. For me personally, in my own life, I don't think I was, I mean, I've, I've lived by myself for 40 years up in the mountains in a remote spot, and why didn't I go back to a community? Well, I, communal living isn't my best way of being. So I think that as older people, I think it's a great idea, but there would be the same kind of um, difficulties with each other and personality conflicts and um, that there were when we were younger. So I, I probably won't. I intend to be in my house until I die. <laughs>
Thank you.